So the question I want to ask you this afternoon is a very simple one, but it's a difficult one to answer. The question is, where are you going to stand? Where are you going to stand in the drama that you have just been caught up in? Because the story that you've just heard and the retelling of it we saw in the Stations of the Cross this morning is not a gruesome fairy tale. It's not simply ancient history. But it's actually the drama of human existence. It's the great drama of the human condition. And so that means that whether you're aware of it or not, whether you're ready or not, you're caught up in the drama. You're caught up in the story. And so I want to ask you again, where are you going to stand? Are you going to stand with Judas? The thing you've got to know about Judas is that he wasn't a bad guy to start with. He joins Jesus' group because Jesus calls him. And I think he goes along with it because he wants to see Israel free from the oppression of their Roman persecutors. He believes that his country can be liberated. And so he hitches his wagon to Jesus and says, I think you're the guy. You're the one who is going to liberate the people. And to begin with, it looked like that was going to work. But then Jesus started saying some outrageous things like turn the other cheek and to renounce violence in all its forms. And Judas becomes profoundly disillusioned. He thought this was the man. But it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer that it's not going to work. At least not the way Judas thinks it's going to work. He thought that the Romans would run out of Israel, tail between their legs. And instead, what becomes clearer and clearer is that it's his group that is going to lose. And so Judas makes a very clever political decision. He says, I'm out of here and to protect myself, I'm going to sell Jesus out. And so for 30 pieces of silver, he dismisses the logic of love, the logic of peace that Jesus had come to bring and decides instead for the logic of the market and he reduces Jesus to a commodity and says, 30 pieces of silver will be enough for me to look after myself and enough for him to be sold. And we're told that in the other Gospels that when he realises what he has done, he falls into a profound despair. So will you stand with Judas? I think we stand with Judas when God doesn't meet our expectations and we find ourselves disillusioned thinking that the God that we have worshipped has somehow disappointed us. And we, were, and we stand with, G, with Judas when we also find ourselves saying, I no longer believe in the logic of love, the logic of peace, and we choose instead the logic of the market. When we decide to go for a really comfortable lifestyle, when material happiness is all we aim for, when we decide that what we really need is to be comfortable, to be, pr- to be successful. And we don't realise that our lifestyle is based upon the suffering of others. That it's only possible for us to live the way we do in a country like Australia because other people are in economic slavery, sold just like Jesus was. So will you stand with Judas? Will you stand with Pilate? You see, Pilate is an integral cog in the military machine of the Roman Empire. Pilate is the governor of the most troublesome part of the Roman Empire. And he rules it with an iron fist. We know from other sources that Pilate had no problem crucifying hundreds of people in order to keep the Roman peace. The peace that he wins in that part of the world comes at the expense of thousands of lives. 
He's a vicious, brutal man. But Jesus shakes him up in his encounter with him. You see, Pilate's actually a very scared man. He's deeply fearful. He believes in the logic of the iron fist. And when somebody stands before him armed with nothing but the truth, Pilate falters. And Pilate wonders whether there's a way out of this because he's scared by what Jesus has to say. But then in the end, the voice of the crowd is too great. Pilate gets scared when they say, we've got no king but Caesar. And he says, well, I can't have a threat to my boss. And so he decides that Jesus must be crucified. So we stand with Pilate. We stand with Pilate every time we choose violence over peace. When with our words or actions, someone is damaged, destroyed even, by what we say or do. We stand with Pilate every time we turn the word truth into a game. And we say, well, your truth is no different to my truth. But in the process, somebody gets hurt. We stand with Pilate when we let our fear for what is right get in the way with what we know is really true and good. We stand with Pilate, who stands for all the times that violence seems to have the upper hand in our world today. We stand with the soldiers who gambled away Jesus' garments. We stand with them. They gambled the very clothes that Jesus owned. There's a good chance that they were actually drunk when they crucified Jesus. That they'd actually desensitized themselves to what they were doing. That they themselves perhaps had been so brutalized by the task that they thought, we're not going to go through with this again, sober and in our right senses. And so drunk or drugged, they gamble for his clothes. We stand with them. I think we stand with those soldiers every time we decide to self-medicate, to mask the pain inside of us by the time we go looking for drugs or alcohol, the times where we go to gamble, the times we find ourselves falling into porn, the times even when we go looking on Facebook again and again and again in a compulsive kind of way, looking for love, looking for a way to block out the fact that we're lonely, wanting in some way to be desensitized from the fact that there's something inside of us that is craving something that we haven't got. Every time we fall into any form of addiction or compulsive behavior, behavior, we stand with the soldiers who gambled for his clothes. We stand with Peter. You know, Peter goes and he warms himself by the charcoal fire. And when he's asked whether he knows Jesus, the one whom he has followed so closely for three years, the one who has touched his heart in ways that nobody else has ever done, Peter says, no, I've never met the guy. Will you stand with Peter? You see, I think we stand with Peter every time we forego the fire of God's love the incredible burning furnace of the divine love for the human family, every time we ignore that, forsake that, and choose a charcoal fire and decide to warm ourselves there, what kind of fire do you warm yourself at? Perhaps it's every time you go looking for a relationship, thinking that this will give you the love that you need, thinking that this will provide the sense of peace that you crave. There's nothing wrong with a relationship. But if in the process of warming yourself by that fire, you deny the one who has the unquenchable fire, the unconquerable fire of love for you, then you settle for a charcoal fire when there is a mighty furnace of love for you. Will you stand with Peter, who forsook the love, who gave away the love that he knew Jesus had for him and chose to warm himself by a very poor substitute. Will you stand with Peter? Or will you stand at the foot of the cross? 
Will you stand today at the foot of the cross? You see, it's at the foot of the cross that we hear Jesus speak to us. None of the people I have just mentioned could hear Jesus talking to them from the cross. But upon the cross, Jesus speaks to them. And that means he speaks to you and me as well. And he says to us, those of us who are willing to dare to stand at the foot of the cross, he says, I thirst. What does he thirst for? What's that mean? It means that he loved you, that he desired you, that God loved you, that God desired you, even when you were standing in the wrong spot, even when we were standing with Judas, and even when we were standing with Pilate, and even when we were standing with the soldiers or with Peter, he loved you there. He didn't wait for you to come to the foot of the cross. He loved you when you were outside, when you were with those who would not come to the foot of the cross. He loved you at that moment and all of those moments in your life. When he says from the cross, I thirst, he's saying with the, all of the love in his human heart that the, reflects the very heart of God, I loved you when you had run away from me. I loved you when you denied me. I loved you when you betrayed me. I loved you there. I loved, I loved you when you thought you were as far as you could possibly go. I loved you there. That's what his thirst for us means. That's what it means when he says from the cross, I thirst. He wasn't just physically thirsty. He wanted you. He wanted me. He wanted every human heart, every human being. He wanted us to know that he loved us even when, and especially when, we did not love him back. And from the cross, he also says to us, as he dies, that it's finished. What's that mean? Again, it's a word of incredible love. We were told last night in the readings, and Father Dave picked it up, that Jesus loved us to the end. And it's the same word when he says it's finished. What he means is simply this, that he loved you enough to actually stand in your place. You see, when he died upon the cross, that wasn't just the end of his earthly life, but it was the end result. It was the destination that we come to when we choose to stand anywhere else but at the foot of the cross. When you choose to stand somewhere else than at the foot of the cross, the consequence of that, the inexorable logic of that, the way it works out in human history is that people are miserable, that people are hurt, and broken, that lives are smashed, that people experience the destruction of relationship. It means incredible loneliness. It's actually a foretaste of hell. Sometimes in the imagery of the church, when we see people paint what hell might look like, they use the imagery of the fires of hell. But one of the great Christian poets, Dante, when he came to draw hell, when he came to paint a portrait of it, he paints the devil in beautiful words. He paints the devil as actually being encased in ice and weeping in incredible loneliness. When we sin, when we stand in the wrong spot, it's not that we are being punished, but that the very effect of sin itself makes us definitively lonely isolated, divided, separated. Everything that God would not want for us. The complete contrary of his purpose and plan for us. And so when Jesus says it's finished, he takes your place. He stands where you and I should have stood. And in that action, he makes it possible for us to be forgiven, for relationships to be restored, for people's lives to be put back together, for people to know that love that has no end, to know a love that is unconquerable, a love that can be never be defeated. He makes it possible by taking upon himself all the effects of our standing in the wrong spot because he stands there in our place. And not only that, he says to us, you can stand where I stand. 
which is with his Father, which is with the love that Jesus has known since the foundation of the world, that the only Son of God has always received from his Father. He wants you to stand there. He swaps places with us so that we might know the very love that the Father has for his Son, that you might be loved in just that same way, that you might receive the very love that the Father has for Jesus. That's why there can be no question of punishment here. The Father wasn't punishing us for our sins, nor does he punish Jesus in our sake. It was for love that he did this. It was for love that the Father allows his Son to be crucified. And it was for love that the Son goes to the cross. Love of us. Love so that when Jesus says on the cross, it's finished, he means that your sin is dealt with. Your standing in the wrong spot is changed forever. If you will but come to the foot of the cross. If you will but come to the place to receive the forgiveness and the freedom and the mercy and above all else, the incredible, unquenchable fire of the love of God. A love that no love can compare with, that no charcoal fire will come close to because you have touched the fire that can never go out, the love that can never, ever be quenched. So I want to say to you tonight, this afternoon, where are you going to stand? Where are you going to stand? In fact, where are you going to kneel? Where are you going to kneel? Because in the face of such love, in the light of such love, you can move. We have all stood with someone other than Jesus We've all stood in places other than the foot of the cross. But you and I can move, my brothers and sisters. We can move this afternoon. We can move to the foot of the cross. And we can kneel there to find the love that we have been searching for, the love that has sent us looking in all sorts of spots, the love that we're made for, and the love that Jesus came to bring. When he says it's finished... It's because he's done everything necessary for you and I to know and receive that love. Come to the foot of the cross this afternoon. Come and kneel before the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ.